You know, probably the most common question I've been asked during the whole campaign is, why are you running for judge? And I really wish there was a five second or 30 second answer I could give that we could use in a commercial, but it's really much more complex than that. Um, so I have to kind of tell you the whole thing from beginning to end for you to really understand. You see, I used to be an assistant district attorney and I used to come home every day feeling like I had done something that day to make a difference. Same thing for when I was a city councilman. You know, Carrie, my wife, used to laugh at me because I would come home and say, this is what I did to make the world a better place today. And usually it was because I'd helped somebody with a minor problem or, or given somebody an opportunity to make a change in their life. But it made me feel good. And about two or three years ago, my wife, being the wiser of the two of us, I remember she had a talk with me and she said, you know, you need to be thinking about what you want to do with the end of your career. And I hadn't really thought about it, but my legal career is about two thirds over. At that time, I wasn't 50 yet, but I'm 50 now. And I, I remember she was right. And so we, we both started talking and thinking about what I should do next. And we agreed that I really missed that feeling that I had made a difference, that I, that I had actually made the world a little better place. I have a great job now working for the sheriff. The sheriff's the best boss I've ever had, and I, I say that without any negative connotation about previous bosses that I've had. It's just that Sheriff Mancuso has a unique way of putting people in places where they can be successful, and I learned a great deal from him. And the job I have, though important, doesn't give me that feel-good feeling, that, that, that feeling like I'm making a difference. I represent deputies and the sheriff's department in minor civil disputes. We have hundreds of cars on the road, so there's lots of fender benders that I have to get involved in. And believe it or not, our 1,000 plus inmates sometimes aren't happy and file suits about it. So I stay busy handling those things, and that's important work, but I just don't get that warm and fuzzy feeling. I think I can best illustrate what I'm talking about with a story that happened to me when I was a much younger man. Back in the mid-90s, uh, early 90s, I remember working in the misdemeanor section at the DA's office. And my boss had a friend who was a salesman. And he would come by the office once every week or two, and he had one of those personalities that salesmen need to have. He was this very likable guy. And he would come in and visit with us, and he would bring us donuts, and sometimes he would take us out to lunch. And in fact, on a couple of occasions, we had card games at his house, and he, he cooked a goat for us. I'm not really sure why I ate a goat, but he cooked it, and it was good, so I, I, I ate it. And he was a nice guy, and he was a friend, and that's how I looked at him. Well, one day, his stepson got arrested. And he was arrested for possession of marijuana and two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a juvenile. And I remember my friend and my boss's friend coming to see my boss and saying, hey, look, my boy just got arrested. It's a misunderstanding. He's never been in trouble before. Sure, you guys, surely you guys are going to take care of this. And my boss, in a very wise way, said, well, obviously, helping young first offenders is what we like to do. But it's Rob's case, and Rob's going to make a decision, and we're going to let Rob handle it. Well, that point on, the dad was involved. So my boss stayed involved to kind of protect me from pressure from him. So I said, well, the first thing I need to do is to talk to the kid. And I say kid, he was 18 years old. And the young man came to my office. And I remember he was in my office and I was sitting at my desk and the dad and my boss were sitting off to the side. And I started asking him questions because I have a rule. I like to get to the root of the problem so that I know I'm doing something to solve it. And the more I talked to the boy, the more I asked him questions, the less cooperative he became. You know, I asked him, like, you know, where did you get the marijuana? Had y'all smoked marijuana together before? Where were you going to smoke the marijuana? And none of the answers really made sense. And I really got the feeling that he was just lying to me. And it frustrated me because I was there to help him. And at some point, after about 20 minutes of absolutely just getting frustrated, I remember I reached into my desk and I pulled out a waiver form. Now, this is a form that we gave people to go to the pathology lab to submit to a drug test. And by signing the form, it allowed the pathology lab to send me the results. So I signed my portion of the form, and I slung it across my desk to him, and I said, I had enough. You've been lying to me for 20 minutes. I got more important things to do. I want you to take that form, fill it out. I want you and your daddy to get in your car, go down to the pathology lab right now, and submit to a urine test. And then two weeks from now, when I get the results, you can come back and see me, and I'll decide what I'm going to do with you then. And I basically tossed him out of my office. Now, Dad was very upset. His understanding of the meeting was I was going to help his son in the end, and I was unwilling to do that until I knew what the problem was. I wanted to fix the problem so I didn't have to see it again. So two weeks later, the, the, the results come back, and the test is clear. The young boy has no drugs in his system. But on the bottom of the lab report, there's a footnote. 
And the footnote says, and I don't remember the exact words, but it was sort of like a heads up. You know, urine was unusually clear. Not so clear that we can say for sure he was washing out his system, but enough to be concerned about it. Those aren't the exact words, but that was the message. Well, we got the lab results in, and the dad came in two weeks later with his son, but we left the son in the lobby, and the dad walked in, and he was already worked up, upset and irate. And he told my boss, you know, I can't believe y'all are going to do this to my poor son. He's a good kid. And my boss said, calm down. The lab report is clean. We're going to help your son. Just calm down. And I said, yes, but I get to tell him. And they agreed. No one was going to say a word but me. So we're in my boss's office now. My boss is behind his desk. The dad is sitting next to my boss. And the young man comes in and I put him in a chair and I'm standing up by the door and I'm holding the lab results in my hand. And I said, well, I've got your lab results right here. I think we both know what they say. Is there something you want to tell me? And he confessed. He confessed to everything. He confessed to being the shooter on the grassy knoll. He confessed to where Hoffa was buried. And he confessed to the actual crime he committed. He told us that uh, he had gotten the marijuana. And this is the important part. His problem was he didn't have any friends. This 18-year-old boy, for whatever reason, had no friends. And he was using marijuana just to create relationships, to have somebody to hang out with. Now, he confessed to all kinds of things. Truthfully, he confessed to distribution of marijuana, which is a felony. I would have never used that against him because I didn't read him his rights. But the important thing to me was not so much what he had confessed to, but now I knew what the problem was. Now we could address that and try to find a way to fix it. So I told him, great, you take two weeks and you think about what you want to do to fix this problem. Then you come back and see me again. So the boy shakes my hand and walks out the door, and the dad is livid. He is red in the face. He chews out my boss. He chews out me. He says, I can't believe you tricked my son like this. You and I are friends. This is not how it works. And he left the office very upset. But about a week and a half later, the boy came back to see me without his dad. And he said, Mr. McCorkadale, I've been thinking about what you said, and I, I think I know what I want to do. I said, what? He said, I think I want to join the Air Force. I've kind of always wanted to do that, and uh, I think that would be good for me. So I told him, I said, they'll never take you with this charge on your record. But you go take the test. You go apply for the Air Force. You take the admissions test. And if you do a really good job, they'll want you bad enough to come see me. And they'll ask me to dismiss the charges. Sure enough, he goes and takes the test, and he does well. And a few weeks later, this, uh, the Air Force uh, recruiter comes to see me. And he says, Rob, this kid, this kid has some snap. We really want him. Will you, will you really help us out and dismiss the charge? I said, absolutely. I gave the boy my word. I pulled the file out, and I rejected the charge right then. Now, that was the deal. I would reject the charge, but he had to go to the Air Force, and he had to make it. If he flunked out or if he quit, I would just issue a warrant, and we would start the charges over again. So I signed off on the dismissal, and the boy signs up to go to the Air Force, and his dad comes and sees me again, and he is just livid again. He's not screaming at the top of his lungs, but his voice is elevated. He's red in the face. His temper is in flare. And he says, you know, I was in Vietnam and we had more drugs in Vietnam than we ever did in the, in, in the, in the regular community. You've ruined my son's life. And I said, look, your son's 18. He gets to make decisions. Whether you think the law is right or not, he's an adult at 18. He made a decision and I made a promise and I'm going to keep my promise. Well, for the next year and a half or so, the dad still came to our office every week. He would bring donuts for people, he would visit with people, and he would take people to lunch. But whenever he saw me, it was like he didn't know me. It was like we were strangers. He would not even acknowledge my existence. And that's okay. It's part of the job sometimes. But I remember one day, about a year and a half later, maybe a little bit longer or shorter, I was at my desk and the work was really piled up high. I had a big stack of files on one side of my desk and a big stack of files on the other side. And I was taking one and reading it, reviewing it, and moving it to the other stack when I heard a <laughs> on my door. And I looked up and it was my boss's friend. Now remember, he hasn't talked to me in over a year. And he looked at me and he said, do you know where my son is right now? And I had no idea. I, I thought he was dead. I, and I just said, no, sir. I'm sorry, I don't know where your son is. And he told me, my son 
is in an AWACS airplane right now over the desert. And he's directing a tank battle from a computer screen over Desert Storm. He's telling the, the tank operators which tanks are friendly tanks and which tanks they can actually engage. He's got a computer skill that he can take with him into civilian life, but he tells me that he likes the Air Force. He has a family there now. He has friends, and he wants to make it a career. He said, you changed my son's life. Every time I tell this story, I get goosebumps up and down my arm, and I just did again. That's why I'm running for judge. The opportunity to help people make a difference in their life is the most joyous thing any human can ever do. And I remember I told the dad, I didn't change his life. I gave him an opportunity to make a change in his life. And I think that is the trick. And as a judge, my goal is going to be, one, to try to find out what the underlying problem is that causes the offense. And then see if I can fashion a sentence that addresses that problem. Because let me tell you one thing I know for sure. I was a prosecutor for 10 years, and I've been the sheriff's attorney for 14. And it's a cycle. People get arrested, they go to court, they pay a fine, they get arrested, they go to court, and they escalate. And they escalate and graduate to more serious crimes until they finally hurt someone or break into someone's house. And some judge has got to send them to jail. I'm running for city court because in city court, you deal with only minor offenses. That's where the, the career of crime, if you will, starts. And if we can find the problem there and address it, then there's a chance that we can prevent all of these other victims from ever being victimized. I'm running for judge to make a difference. And I believe my experience as a prosecutor, as the sheriff's attorney, as a former city councilman, as a husband and as a father, uniquely prepare me to make those important decisions.